What's up, Marcelo? Uh, hello, hello. Can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear okay. me? Oh, I, I, just, I just, one I second. just, um, I heard that my microphone was, uh, was funny. So let me know if you don't hear me well. Uh, I might have to change uh, headsets. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. How's it been so good. far? Uh, good, good, good. Very exciting. Uh, our five, four, four already. This is number number five out of ten. Awesome. Uh, exciting. Um, and and we began with uh, I guess maybe uh, larger questions about institutions and then social practices landscape and we just concluded with Brian and a much more direct uh, Brian Lee from Collocate and Design as Practice more direct awesome. on, on questions about architecture itself and practice and all that. So uh, it's a good segue into into your work, hopefully. Okay. Um, so, so what we were thinking is when we present, we will turn our camera off. Yeah. So uh, the PDF will be full screen. Uh, That's fine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So thanks to you formally, uh, Emmanuel and Jen, uh, for uh, for joining us, uh, we are uh, continuing our uh, conversations marathons and making the public comments. Uh, Emmanuel and Jen are the principals and founders of Adwo, uh, an art and architectural practice. Uh, I think it's moving, moving, moving target right now locations, but uh, it is right now based in Providence, in, in, but also with uh, uh, an expanded. Uh, places and locations in, uh, in Ethiopia and Australia as well. Um, their work uh, is, in, inquires the practice of architectural design and make disciplinary questions, uh, and is also uh, interested in understanding the dynamics uh, of social, political, and social political, economical questions uh, or specific contexts where they engage with uh, through documentation, drawing, and uh, envisioning design and architectural projects ideas. Uh, the work is, is currently on view uh, as part of the exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And their installation uh, focuses on the immeasurability uh, of black spatial practices in Atlanta and the Atlantic. Uh, so with that uh, brief, uh, bio, I will pass it on to uh, Jen Wood and Emmanuel Atmasu. Thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Marcelo. Um, we're looking forward to uh, yeah the conversation afterwards as well. So I'll just share the screen now. Um, and yeah, I'll let me know if you work. see everything. Um, uh, yeah. Can you see see the PDF? Yeah. Yeah, not mm -hmm. a full screen yet, but it's there. Yeah, okay. Um, and sorry, yeah. hold on. Okay. Just one sec. Um, I'm going to stop the video now. Yeah. And I'll call you if. Yeah, now it's there. Just it's not FYI. yet full screen. Okay, can you hear? Yeah, yeah. it's All not right. it's not full screen though. Yeah. Oh yeah, maybe yeah. No. Okay. Great. Okay. Just FYI, Jen is not that much taller than me. She's just sitting on a <laughs> taller chair today. Um, okay, so first of all, we just want to say that we're honored to be invited by you, Marcelo, um, to take part and this marathon event and uh, making the public comments. And obviously we have huge uh, admiration for you, your work and uh, the panelists who came before us. And of course the panelists who are coming after us. Um, as Emmanuel said, we are especially looking forward to the discussion with you all afterwards. Um, but uh, yeah, time is of the essence. So we'll jump right into it. So for some context, we have um, a practice that is committed to both building and unbuilding, uh, i.e. 
we take on commissioned building projects while simultaneously producing research directed towards addressing the failures of the discipline of architecture. Um, but today we will be using two projects to talk about measures in relation to architecture and our attempts to think outside or against this regime of quantification. Over the last uh, 10 years, we've been drawing urban marketplaces in East Africa, Karyako in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and Mercato in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We believe that one of the most generative ways to think about uh, the contemporary transformations taking place in African cities is through the documentation of their spatial practices and their urban marketplaces. Karyako and Mercato are not only sites of local trade, but they are also sites where global regimes are being negotiated. From the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative to the ever-present pre-colonial and colonial histories, a series of rituals unfold at the scale of the body, the city, and the planet. We, we all know that histories, and in some cases empires, uh, are constructed through specific tools of visual representation. Basically, who gets to represent whom and under what uh, circumstances but also what value system is being communicated and visualized through that drawing. We're specifically interested in investigating the colonial obsession with measurability, uh, a specific worldview that understands land as something that should be measured, owned, and exploited. This is how the continent of Africa was partitioned at the infamous Berlin Conference in 1884 on the left facilitating the extraction of resources and labor from the continent to Europe and North America. The map on the right measures the density of enslaved people in each county in the state of Georgia in 1861. Another example is the nine by nine meter grid of the coconut shamba or farm established by Sultan Majid bin Said of Zanzibar in 1862 and that basically initiated a regime of measurability on uh, Dar es Salaam. The land, its people, and its resources have since been allotted to quantify the units. Under the direction of the German colonial regime, the coconut shamba transmutes into plots for single family Swahili homes. More recently, the asymmetrical allocation of capital and land rights has transformed these plots into mid-rise residential towers. The name of the neighborhood, Karyako, uh, is a Swahiliized derivation of the Care Corps Depot, a building that was used by German and British troops during the First World War that you can see on the far right in this photograph. And after the war and preceding uh, the market hall of today, the Care Corps Depot was used as the central market of Dar es Salaam. We define architecture as the difference between its content and container. This helps us avoid treating architecture solely as a remnant of networks or as a knowledge of forms. In other words, architecture is always determined by the negotiation between its objecthood and its political context. There seems to be an underlying belief in the discipline of architecture that beauty and politics are mutually exclusive. Each one of these drawings was produced through an extended collaboration with architects, photographers, and academics in Dar es Salaam and Addis Ababa. We are drawing the material and immaterial conditions that produce and sustain these sites. This issue of mobility, the mobility of images, ideas, architects, and resources has been a fundamental aspect of our practice. This mobility is pursued while acknowledging the inherent asymmetries of global capital and the fact that exchange is always loaded and never equal. Two Markets is a drawing project, uh, first exhibited as 16 large format drawings backed with reflective corrugated aluminum. This is the view from the entrance to the gallery where it was first shown, nodding to the aerial photographs that are typically employed to represent African cities as homogenous corrugated roofscapes. One of our earliest experiments in representation was a seven minute stop motion animation that we produced in collaboration with the artist Ezra Wube. Ezra translated our drawings and diagrams of Rakato into these immersive worlds made from found images uh, and his own sketches, photographs, and audio recordings.
This was followed by a large nine by 14 foot tapestry for the African Mobilities Exhibition in Munich, curated by Imprimat Sipa. This tapestry resembles the market into an array of 126 scenes and is a response to how Mercato's merchants have devised strategies to anchor themselves to the marketplace. Studying and learning from Charles Gaines's uh, numbers and trees on the right. These market scenes were transcribed into elevations and codified into woven notations uh, based on their degree of material permanence. This notational system flattened spatial hierarchies, equalizing merchandise, stalls, vehicles, and buildings. Uh, the project was, uh, when we initiated the project, we identified two of uh, advisors, Professor Daniel Mbiso and Dara Salam, and architect Rahul Shaul in Addis Ababa. We also engaged a photographer from each city, Nicholas Calvin uh, and Zacharias Elias Abubica. We chose to research two cities in relative proximity in sub-Saharan Africa to demonstrate difference in a context that is consistently essentialized and rendered as homogenous. For example, the Italian occupation of Addis lasted only five years. <clears throat> Excuse me, therefore the colonial master plan was never fully actualized. While Dar es Salaam endured around 500 years of colonial invasion, beginning with the Portuguese in 1498. So for two markets, we adopted a theoretical framework inspired by Harry Garuba's definition of animist materialism, a continual re-enchantment of the world or the superimposition of magical narratives on everyday objects. Animist materialism basically works in opposition to the linear representation of time, collapsing multiple temporalities into one site. Uh, throughout this process, we have been analyzing specific urban interventions, like the quote unquote neutral zone in Dar es Salaam. This inaccessible park is a buffer that enforces racial segregation uh, designed by the colonial, uh, the German colonial regime and emplaced by the British as a sanitary barrier between African and Indian populations of Dar es Salaam. 50 years after the country's independence, this seemingly benign piece of infrastructure continues to divide the city. A singular mall now occupies each city block in Mercato, owned by large cooperatives of merchants. Unlike marginalized communities in other parts of the city, the merchants in Mercato are basically able to resist massive displacement by developing anti-gentrification lobbies and convincing the government to let them develop their own land. Today, only 2% of Tanzanians have access to a formal bank account. Uh, pointing to major shortcomings in traditional banking systems and their government oversight. Uh, and of course, resulting cash-based systems are obviously prone to manipulation, insecurity, and corruption. In response to this, M-Pesa apps gained massive popularity. Uh, M, <clears throat> sorry, M refers to mobile, while Pesa means money in Swahili. So um, these M-Pesa apps are now used by more than 65% of urban Tanzanians, allowing them to pay uh, and receive money with their phone. The Karaoke Market Hall, which is, which is the anchor of the neighborhood in Dar es Salaam, is an open air structure shaded by 24 concrete funnels, each spanning 15 meters that harvest rain and facilitate passive cooling for the trading space below. In 1974, uh, the Karaoke Market Hall was designed by uh, Beda Amuli, and, and it was really constructed as an animist enactment of the Arusha Declaration, which introduced President uh, Julius Nereri's political philosophy of Jama or familyhood, promoting egalitarianism, socialism, and self-reliance. It also represents a brief moment of post-colonial optimism on the continent. The colonial fragmentation of the city of Dar es Salaam is uh, registered at the scale of the city block in Kariko. Each block is composed of multiple plots that are individually owned, demonstrating a negotiation between the single family Swahili homes that have been you know, incrementally converted into retail spaces. The resulting interstitial spaces are now being intensified by the former president, John Magafuli's legitimization of street traders. 
In Mercato, a brightly painted fence is, in, is interrupted by signage for the CGCOC Group, a Chinese-owned Belt and Road Initiative contractor whose revenue is greatly derived from building roads throughout the African continent. The pale concrete frame basically foreshadows a, a bus terminal within a network of transportation infrastructure that is almost exclusively uh, constructed by the Chinese government. In summer 2019, I was invited to participate in the group show titled Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America at the Museum of Modern Art. At an early advisory meeting, Saidia Hartman in conversation with Tina Kantz and Mabel Wilson challenged us to imagine projects that practice refusal against a racialized enclosure and the enclosure of privatization. On the right is an etching of Savannah, Georgia in 1734. And you can see how the colonial logic of measurability erases indigenous forms of occupation, replacing them with privatized enclosures. This notion of measurability was fundamental to the work we produced for reconstructions. On the left is a painting uh, titled The Squeeze by Audubon and Kanga. The conversion of land into property happened in conjunction uh, with the conversion of human beings into property. Our installation is focused uh, on the city of Atlanta, thinking with uh, the different levels of containment and displacement experienced by Black people in the city. Hopefully the most significant legacy of this show is of course the formation of the Black Reconstruction Collective. The 10 of us uh, who were commissioned for the show decided to form a nonprofit uh, in order to continue the work of reconstruction well after the passing event of the exhibition. This is our manifesting textile uh, covering the name of the gallery. Edward's contribution to the exhibition is called Immeasurability. And here we are attempting to imagine an architecture without measure uh, nor enclosure. Our installation is made up of two discs, a vertical disc and a horizontal disc. Uh, the horizontal disc operates in the scale of the city, specifically Atlanta, Georgia and the vertical disc uh, operates at the scale of the planet, depicting the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Atlanta is not known for beautiful monumental architecture, uh, but instead it is defined through its highways, strip malls, and single family homes that sit alongside and within tracts of wooded land. There is a multiplicity uh, to these ordinary spaces and how they are transformed by Black people into sites of liberation and cultural production. One example of uh, these ephemeral spatial practices is Freaknik, a citywide party that ran annually uh, from the early 1980s to the mid 1990s and primarily attended by students from historically black colleges and universities. The massive influx of black students from around the country caused traffic jams that subsequently became uh, these street parties. And uh, we would argue that these quotidian spaces um, are obviously not only sites of joy and liberation, but also sites of danger and state sanctioned violence. This oscillation between danger and safety is evident throughout popular culture that represents the city. For example, uh, in Donald Glover's TV show, Atlanta, where Alfred escapes into the woods after a violent altercation, um, where he soon realizes that his refuge is perhaps even more terrifying than the violence he was running away from. So we are interested in spaces that are both mythical and ordinary, and the overlaps between the woods and these spaces that appear as clearings. The horizontal disc of our installation is composed of 160 bricks of these everyday spaces sitting on top of an inverted cone. We're also interested in the racial connotations of ordinary architectural elements. For example, in Atlanta, Waffle House has specific associations with Black culture. Uh, the introduction of a Waffle House sign in a forest, uh, in essence, transforms it into a space of blackness. So these ideas of spatial instability led us to thinking of sand as a metaphorical material to work with. And this project basically operates uh, from the fundamental belief that blackness is about flow, not form. And uh, these are some early experiments of turning black sand into uh, glass.
we applied this black sand to the um, the 160 brick models um, on the horizontal disc. The sand also flows across the top of the disc through and around a dense forest uh, of trees, uh, vehicles, people, and buildings. We wanted to work uh, specifically with magnetite sand, black sand for several reasons. One being the fact that it is a material found on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and another being its magnetic properties. It was also important to work within a limited color spectrum where edges and forms are not easily discernible. So there's a, a deeper interest in issues of legibility. We constantly come back to this series of Chris Ophelia paintings called the Blue Devils uh, on the right here. Ophelia uses silver paint mixing with these really dark blues so that the different forms within the painting are revealed from different vantage points. Uh, so one has to move around the canvas to capture oblique fragments of the image rather than, rather than being able to take it all in from one position. Uh, we've become slightly obsessed with this idea that the process of dynamically reassembling fragments, in a sense, creates a larger and more expansive image. The magnetic black sand of the horizontal disk is being subtly animated uh, by magnetized robots underneath the glass disk, sliding on parallel rails that you can see on the right here. Our meditation on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge has been uh, deeply influenced by a long list of contemporary artists who have been wor uh, making work about the Atlantic Ocean as a site and a subject for the formation of Blackness. Uh, for example, Mati Diop's recent film, Atlantics. The tapestry we produced for reconstructions is a timescape of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. For those not familiar, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a tectonic plate boundary on the ocean floor between Africa and the Americas, which is constantly expanding due to matter being pushed up from the Earth's mantle. This planetary scar uh, is a site for, of course, the incalculable loss of Black life uh, due to the forced migration of enslaved Africans uh, during the Middle Passage and the ongoing displacement caused by uh, neocolonialism and what Saidiya Hartman calls the afterlife of slavery. But it is also a site of formation and a way prefiguring a global black aesthetic. Eli Whitney uh, patented the cotton gin in Pinfat in Georgia. The city of Atlanta was established as a terminus for federally funded train lines that were linking the port of Savannah to the hinterlands. Uh, therefore, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is really a metaphor for this entanglement, linking the port of Savannah, Georgia, to the door of no return in West Africa. We collected a series of maps that were drawn uh, to contain the dynamism of the Atlantic. Uh, these on the screen were created by Matthew Fontaine Mori, uh, also known as the Pathfinder of the Seas, to expedite the trade of goods across the Atlantic. So measuring not only land, but also wind and ocean current patterns to facilitate the larger project of extraction. Uh, Maury eventually resigned his commission as a US Navy commander and joined the Confederacy uh, during the Civil War. Our goal, was for the, uh, our goal was for the tapestry to also convey more contemporary forms of surveillance and policing uh, that limit the mobility of black people. Uh, we started working with um, and transforming these found forms of cartographic and oceanographic notations and layering them with other more recent cultural references. It was important for us to work in a medium that subverted the clean vector boundaries between um, colored fills. Similarly to perhaps what the black sand achieves with the models on the table, the medium of tapestry transforms the drawing. We lost your sound. Hello, Marcelo, yeah. can yeah. you hear us? Now you're back. Okay. okay. Can you hear us? Can you hear yes. us now? Yes, yes, okay. we can. Okay. We're on the last slide. Um, uh, I'm not sure where we cut out, but I'll just start this sentence again. It was important uh, to work in a medium that subverted the clean vector boundaries between fills. Similarly to perhaps what the black sand achieves with the models on the table, the medium of tapestry transforms the drawing into something textured and three-dimensional. 
with silk wool and other threads of various thicknesses and rigidities. And these are some installation shots um, where you can see the horizontal disc and the tapestry and these two large vinyls. This is it in context next to uh, Walter Hood's installation on the left. And these are more um, detailed shots. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, where are you? There. Let me change my screen. Here. Um, thank you uh, for for the presentation, uh, both of you. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's an interesting continuation from or both transition. I will say maybe from uh, from what we were seeing um, in our last presentation with Brian in a way that. Um, you are uh, you define a practice that is clearly between art and architecture, and I will maybe want to begin there, um, mostly as a as, as a way of introducing the the question of who is seen in the work, uh, who is uh, both who is not just who is represented only, but also who is seen, who is shaping, who is uh, formulating the work. And, and I would like you to uh, tell us a little bit more about your, your modes of collaborations, uh, because you, you uh, in, in various times, uh, suggested right, or, or mentioned that you work with photographers or other artists or even inspired by. And, and could you tell us a little bit more about uh, how, do you, how do you see yourself in that process of seeing, right, of who has been uh, who is seen by by being represented, and and, and, and what does that in, uh, sort of produce in the uh, in in your work? Uh, if if I elaborate a little bit more in in, in the market drawings, for example, uh, they are they are significantly kind of dense and rich and dynamic, and um, and it's almost like we can right the the, the, the quality of the drawing appeals to to the experience. Uh, and then, and, but, and, and it's interesting drawing because they are they are made with uh, with let's say very no very con very known traditions or conventions about drawing, uh, but at the same time they begin to kind of depart those conventions. So, uh, can you elaborate more about uh, those ways of seeing and representation? Okay. Um. Yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, um, I, I would say this is something that we're actively working on. You know, um, a lot of it is obviously driven by our love for architecture, uh, but also simultaneously our disappointment with its lack of imagination. And uh, there's a certain blindness that is embedded in architectural representation that we're trying to address by pivoting towards more of an art practice. So a lot of the knowledge production can't really materialize in the realm of commissioned buildings that we're designing. So we're, we're, we're really trying to stretch uh, the limits of representation uh, by obviously engaging in conversation with other disciplines, but also reintroducing subjects that are typically edited out of uh, architectural representation. Yeah, I think... As you were asking your question, I was thinking back to this text that we always refer to by um, Anurada Iya Siddiqui in her essay, Writing With. Um, and within that essay, she kind of talks about how, um, I guess it touches upon like feminist standpoint theory, as in like, how can we like collect, uh, collectively imagine space? And what does it mean to represent space from multiple vantage points? So I guess that was what, um, where we started from when we were producing the, the drawings for mm -hmm. two markets. Sort of like within our limited sort of architectural representational scope, we, we used um, the plan oblique. So it's like a plan elevation in, in one drawing. So trying to capture those um, architectural viewpoints. And, and then, as you mentioned, there was like a flattening effect that we were striving for to sort of equalize um, building and uh, goods being sold and vehicles and signage, like sort of equalizing that hierarchy, which um, often you don't see in, in drawings, especially of 
drawings from the west of the rivers uh, that was there. Yeah, I will. I will uh, just as we uh, warm up, pass the, the the mic to Janet Kim, uh, who has her hat raised, and uh, and then we can continue building up. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question that I wanted to follow up on. And first of all, it's such a pleasure to see you. Your work is just so stunning and moving, and I just just so so cute. I just really appreciate your presentation. And um, so I had a similar question about drawing, and I was just so interested in the way you talked about, you know, vector boundaries between the color field and then the magnetized sand and the tapestry and like all of these things seem to be different ways of drawing and of kind of making and building. And um, so I was, I was really thinking that I had a temptation to assign meanings to those different types of drawings, for example, to say, you know, like, you know, vector drawings are servicing parcelization of land, whereas the tapestry evokes labor of a person who makes the tapestry. Um, but then I also, um, and, and, but then of course I was like, well, you know, like and the, of course with the question of uh, the yarn also comes questions of where that material is coming from and might be just as extractive in many ways as the system of property and so on. So anyway, I'm just kind of curious to understand your readings of, of like the kind of politics and metaphor and kind of labor affiliations or just any of the meanings that you see associated with those different um, materials of representation. Yeah, first of all, it's really great to see you. I mean, I didn't even know the other panelists were here. Um, I thought we were just presenting to Marcelo, so it's great <laughs> to have you here. Um, yeah, it's a difficult question, you know. I mean, I think uh, to a certain extent with two markets, we kept trying to get rid of the line, you know, and, and <laughs> we kept trying to get rid of um, the vector. And I think that's very much tied to, you know, uh, a refusal um to the regime of property to a certain extent and that's kind of the underlying logic that is helping us look at the two markets differently um and i mean it's it's hard to determine if it's successful or not because the color field still maintain the unitization um that was there um but with um immeasurability it was really initially trying to produce these bricks that dissolve so we wanted to produce a model where the actual form of it dissolves within the sand. And we were doing a series of these experiments almost for two months with the glass department at RISD, where we were kind of experimenting with how black sand transforms into black glass. And this is kind of shop talk, but basically eventually we got a quote to do all 160 models out of glass and it was upwards of $250,000. <laughs> so, it became kind of uh, the struggle of, you know, maintaining those ambitions of a model that erases itself, that dissolves while using materials that are uh, much, much cheaper and more accessible. Um, so the application of the sand itself was basically a labor of love, love in our friend's basement in Brooklyn, where we sat down for like a week and just applied sand to um, the models. But it's, it, it is a constant struggle. And, and I think when you're representing something as monumental and symbolic as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, then these larger questions that you're talking about uh, with, the, with surveillance and the swarm, but also the labor of production coming, come into play. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I'm saying all that to say, you're raising a set of issues that we're actively trying to work through. Um, and that's precisely what this presentation is, <laughs> is about, I guess. Yeah, it, it's actually making me think of maybe a, a, a chapter to this project, like to index the, the labor in a certain way, like, you know, the, the energy required to like heat the sand to a certain mm -hmm. point that becomes glass. And then, you know, the sand that we got is actually from Arizona, but um, yeah, what, what, what did it take to get that into the MoMA and I guess, yeah, everything is loaded, you know, like we're getting rid of the vector, but as you mentioned, that introduces um, sort of other, another set of politics to contend with. Yeah. I, I, I will follow up um, with that. Um, maybe, wait, maybe there is a question that I will first. Miranda, you want to, uh, 
elaborate on that uh, yourself? Can you, maybe your voice is better than mine too. <laughs> yes, um, hi. I enjoyed y'all's presentation so much. I love from beginning to end. And I just wanted to ask, um, I'm also a Georgia peach. I, so I just wanted to know what made y'all choose Georgia in comparison to Africa? Yeah, I mean, so basically uh, when, um, when the invitation went out for the MoMA show, they wanted each one of us to choose a particular uh, city to study. Um, and when, uh, when I was around like 14, I moved from Addis Ababa to Atlanta. So I kind of partially grew up in Atlanta for 10 years. Um, so it just made sense that, you know, my second home could be, could be the site that we study. And most of my family is still in Atlanta as well. So it's a city that we constantly go back to, you know, multiple times a year. But, but I think beyond that, beyond the kind of <laughs> biographical information, there is something deeply symbolic about Atlanta when it comes to black culture, obviously. There's just kind of an incredibly rich history of, you know, um, obviously the Atlanta University with Du Bois, Dr. King, like it's just an endless list, you know? Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, what people are doing within the city um, today, you know, a lot of people kind of really engaging with abolitionist framework when it comes to addressing a lot of the kind of urgent issues that we have has, has been a constant reference point. So we just wanted to be in conversation with that city when thinking about anti-Blackness and how that shapes American cities. Mm -hmm. um, we also have family from there who are very much involved in that activism. So, and and we involved them in at the start of uh, immeasurability where we had these salon sessions mm -hmm. where they they kind of told us how how much we didn't know about the city and really <laughs> held us to account, like yeah. like made us accountable for like the work that we produced. So, they were like such an invaluable resource. Um, yeah, and also just contemporary culture. I feel like you know. Mm -hmm. all the music we listen to is from Atlanta so and you know um it just made sense if we're talking about you know uh, blackness and architecture in 2021 it made sense to talk about Atlanta um and I just have one last question speaking about the blackness I know y'all gave the example I believe you said from the 1980s to the 2000s and y'all were talking about Freak Me and you talked about Waffle House did y'all think about any other uh, like events that are about like blackness, such as um, like the Battle of the Bands, that's very big, or any other events or places that symbolize? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's kind of, you know, we basically had several lists going uh, and all of it was trying to look at spaces that demonstrate everyday practices, you know, just quotidian practices that at least for me that I was engaged in when I lived in Atlanta, you know, waking up and going to the strip mall to pick up something and, you know, on the way back picking up coffee. And we just wanted to engage with those banal activities that in some way maintain a lot of meaning, you know? And I think there's a tendency when you talk about Atlanta to talk about kind of the more monumental aspects of the city and its history. And this, this project was really an engagement with the Black quotidian and, and needed to be something a little bit more um, humble and direct. And that's why kind of the focus has been on strip malls and kind of highway overpasses. Um, I think there was a model of Magic City in there um, with the parking lot. So we kind of, if you look at the 160 bricks, they're basically fragments from all over the city. And all of them are kind of relatively um, ordinary spaces. Thank you so much again. Yeah, and y'all make y'all make me proud to be from Atlanta. And y'all did so much justice with this. Thank you again. So, I mean, that, that was uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, but I, I wanted uh, to go back to some of your uh, initial thoughts on, on particularly on building. 
uh, you you kind of state that as a, as a beginning principle, and, and I am uh, myself a, a, a uh, confessed uh, uh, unbuilder, uh, and I need the practice of unbuilding, uh, not just building. Um, so, can you can you maybe tell us more a, bit, a little bit about how your your practice uh, engages with that notion of unbuilding? Uh, because I, I'm, I'm sure that there's there is uh, various kind of layers to that that might speak to maybe a building of institutions or a building of ideas or forms of practice or, or certain kind of conventions and canons, um, not, not necessarily maybe on building a physical thing or, or, or not, not limited to that. So can you tell us a bit more on that? <laughs> um, so I think Maybe we'll talk about Colleen a little bit, um, but I I just, yeah, I guess like the questions that we're most interested in um, a building uh, most often is not the answer. So <laughs> that's why we've been uh, scrambling to like form connections with people sort of on the edge of the discipline or outside of the discipline to help us think about, um, uh, yeah, sort of architecture from, um, yeah, from beyond the discipline. So like we, uh, that has led us to produce some small publications like newspapers, um, obviously artifacts for exhibitions. Uh, we work with like podcasts and, you know, create kind of trends like that. Um, but then, yeah, we also really love designing buildings. So we're, we're designing a, a, <laughs> an apartment building that's about to start construction in Addis Ababa. And, and yes, it, it is. Um, yeah, we, we kind of have accepted that conflict between these two uh, pursuits of our practice. Uh, not to say that, you know, arms up in the air, what are you going to do about it? Like, it's, it's just a conflict that we're continuing to negotiate. And, um, and also, it, it sort of feeds into how we organize our practice and um, sort of our internal organization um, with ourselves and with our employees. Um, but yeah, also sort of continuing to think about the failures or the shortcomings of the discipline mm -hmm. uh, by stepping outside it when we can. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, you know, um, there is something exciting about, you know, with, with, the, with the apartment building that we're uh, working on currently, it just gave us an opportunity to extend another research project into a particular typology, which is the compound house. Um, and I think that's really just beginning. <laughs> and we, we, we started really reflecting on what that might mean, uh, because I think in this conversation around property, you know, the compound houses in Addis really become these uh, zones that allow for an incredible amount of porosity, you know? At any given time, there's 30 to 40 people in a compound house and everyone is engaged in different activities, you know, and not everyone lives in that compound. And I think, at least for us, that's not a typology that's limited to Ethiopia. It's found all over the continent. It's found, you know, in South America. So um, we just think that's a rich area of research that might uh, lead to a better apartment building design, or it might just lead to something else, you know? We don't really know what gets produced out of these engagements, but to a certain extent, we've agreed to maintain the rift between, you know, knowledge production and building production, uh, knowing that at some point there will be some overlaps. And as a, as a kind of a continuation of that, uh, and now that you brought the, the, the project of, of the building, uh, House and building, which we the ones that are not fully familiar, it's a little bit behind Jen in the back. Uh, it's you, you are also interested in, in kind of uh, question forms of property, right? And I know that there is part of this uh, take on property that, that questions the uh, the understanding of bodies and, and, and people as property uh, on one side, but also uh, the transformation of of architectural elements and land and, and, and such as, as property. Uh, is there 
is there a mechanism that you have explored, or, or, or what are the kinds of opportunities to re envision forms of property or to abolish property, or what as a kind of, I, I guess, continuation on, on the question of home building, if that is something that uh, you, you are you have encounter opportunities to engage with or ambitions to do so, because of course it's extremely challenging to, to think about how do we do that. So, uh, yeah, the, a little bit on the on the extension of the unbuilding to property, and, or maybe on property, ideally. <laughs> um, yeah, so the past two semesters I've been teaching a studio called After Property, and it's been, it's been a challenging studio to teach uh, because it's really hard to use architectural tools um, without kind of, you know, solidifying the regime of property or <laughs> re-articulating the limits of property. Um, so the students have really been looking at spatial practices uh, in different parts of the world that operate against property. And, and some of, uh, most of it has been about really um, collecting a set of samples that challenge our assumptions about property and then redeploying those samples on a particular site. Um, you know, just, this is an anecdote, but last night there was, um, I was part of a conversation and uh, one of the people involved was uh, Savi Horn and she really works on um, kind of the legal frameworks uh, uh, of property, you know, especially when it comes to black land ownership in the South. And she's working in North Carolina and she's a lawyer. And she she had really, really specific answers. You know, with my students, we've been kind of operating in the realm of image production. It's just been about like imagining a world after property. Whereas with her, it's really been about clear strategies on how to make sure that people don't get displaced, you know? Um, and she was speaking about a particular community land trust that uh, she's developing with black farmers in North Carolina and really kind of walking us through that process, you know? And, and I think with, with both of us, we've been trying to understand what these different forms of collective ownership might be. Um, so I think, although it's liberating within a, a studio context to operate primarily from the standpoint of imagination. I think there are moments where we have to engage uh, with the constraints imposed through the regime and try to kind of, um, yeah, like look at existing examples, you know, from um, people like Sabi who are lawyers working on this. Um, and hopefully some of that knowledge can make its way over to the discipline of architecture. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's a, that's a great, uh, comment to uh, one of the things that we were uh, that Brian was suggesting and we were, we were talking and earlier uh, was precisely about community building and and, and participating in, in a community as a kind of uh, a strategy to uh, to engage to participate in a way that it's uh, not necessarily transactional right and and, and, and we also uh, Sort of, you know, touch upon the challenges of what that entails because our 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 practices and, and I guess primarily our, our labor practices uh, are most likely uh, you know decentering us or, or, and, and moving us all around, right? And 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 if I think about some of us in here, right, we uh, met in New York City, for example, uh, and and for a moment, right, that would that was home or, or and, and, and there was some sense of community but now we're kind of you know completely dispersed and building other forms of community but it's, it's extremely challenging to think about uh, uh, how do we how do we practice this notion of uh, alternative forms of uh, of community building um, but but I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, uh, the concrete example for example of within the context of the US of a community land trust um, as, as a kind of a model uh, that has allowed for uh, questioning that and and the kind of typical kind of single ownership model right um, and I don't want to make this all about property uh, and so all or anything because your you know your work is so much uh, so much more than that uh, but also I don't want to make it just about drawings and representation because it's also not just about that uh, and 
but I'm wondering if um, if you have reflections about your your, your practice in a way it's uh, it benefits from your from your sort of places of, of origin or, or where you come and so on and are there are there other models are there limits to uh, what can we do in the context of uh, of the US right and and and, and it, it seems like it's extremely hard maybe to think about it, it's almost like really trying to to find uh, loopholes right in, in, in a way it is uh, it is how many people and that's and that's why you refer probably to lawyers right which is like yeah they know that maybe there are going to be spaces in which some things can be created as alternative uh, but but are there you know is there a space for another for another enclosure for another outside or for another form where, where we can are there uh, other forms in which from your multiple contexts of, of research and and practice that uh, uh, that you can uh, share with us some some ideas about that, even or even from the studios as well. I think probably Emmanuel has some great examples from the studios, but I, I'll just jump in and say that I I used to work at Big, and I was always struck by um, the people that knew most about zoning loopholes and like ways to wriggle around things were the clients. You know, these big developer clients. Like they're <laughs> the ones that retained these people that wrote the zoning code, you know? So it's like, yes, there's, as you sort of touched upon, it's like these levels of expertise um, of this sort of, you know, guarded information that is only accessible to very few people with wealthy connections, typically. Um, but yeah, maybe in terms of examples, I feel like your studio. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think some of it is just purely about uh, putting a set of questions out there and seeing who else is interested in talking about those questions. And at least for me with, with, with the studios on property, I really didn't know anything about property going into it. I, I was reading a few things um, and was also deeply influenced by the work of Cameron Rowland. And uh, I had been in conversation with him once or twice. So um, that was really the point of departure. But since then, I think even with the research in the marketplaces, us just demonstrating an interest in these issues is allowing us to engage in conversations like this one, you know, with, with other folks who are really invested in, in thinking about alternatives to, to the current condition. I mean, I think what's fundamental is that we um, genuinely believe that, that the status quo is untenable. So, I think whatever it takes for us to form, you know, smaller communities that uh, could collectively think through these big questions um, as, as, as the ambition, you know? And I think scale kind of works against us because the moment this, this expands beyond a relatively manageable and intimate group, then, then it easily gets, you know, co-opted. So we, we always have to find ways to, to remain somehow mobile and agile <laughs> as we're thinking through these questions. No, I, I think these are uh, great, great reflections of the challenges that we have. And I think it, these challenges are, 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 are very different uh, dependent on, on location. Um, and, and I'm also kind of using this as a way to uh, begin to wrap up our, our session uh, and we will move on to uh, in a little while to to one that also uh, kind of engages with a form of practice that uh, resides at, at, at the core of, of an, maybe alternative form uh, of, that will be cooperation, right? Uh, in, in the case of Copia, um, so I, I'm, I'm I'm happy that these are uh, questions that are being brought as we navigate them within the field and the challenges that that uh, creates mostly because the our practice of drawing and our practice of building is it's almost inevitably uh, part of those uh, institutions right that you are also trying to, to question and challenge so uh, it is indeed a, a, a difficult task and I think it it, it really varies by uh, by location but I'm sure we'll, we'll hear also um, a few different alternatives on thoughts about that um, does anyone else from the audience have any other questions? 
before I kind of wrap up with just two or three minutes for a quick breathing before I continue in the next one. Uh, we're beginning, we're moving on to hour five or six, I don't know, I think it's five. Uh, no, six. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good uh, timing. But um, I uh, wanted to thank uh, Imadol and Jen uh, for your for your presentation, for joining us, for your work, uh, and, and really happy that you make this space. Uh, I know you're also extremely busy, um, so uh, thanks so much for joining and, and taking a little space uh, with us today. Hey, thank you guys so much for having us. Good, good. So have a wonderful uh, day. We can't wait to. Sorry, we, <laughs> I know you got to go, but. We can't wait to see the recording. I mean, I got to <laughs> run back and take care of the 14 month old guy at home. But uh, hopefully you'll upload the recording because we, we are big fans of everyone. So. Absolutely. Peace. So uh, as, uh, as we transition, I will say we have uh, three or four minutes uh, to the next, uh, our next guest. Uh, I'll just take a moment to refill my uh, water and then I'll, I'll leave you with the birds uh, on the background uh, while I come back uh, with uh, Copia and then right after with uh, Janet Gibbs also here. See you in a moment. <laughs>